Hi, welcome back. I'm really pleased to kick off our next track, which is the DNA Hit of the Year presentation. Let me bring on stage Tim Schauber, President of Gordon Thomas Honeywell Governmental Affairs, who will present this year's DNA Hit of the Year. Tim, take it away. Well, good morning. It's a pleasure to be back again giving the DNA Hit of the Year talk, and it's also a pleasure to be with Thermo Fisher Scientific's HID conference, the HITS conference, where we give the hit of the year results every year. So thank you very much, and I look forward to a, uh, a great presentation with you folks. So first of all, let's keep in mind the reasons we do the hit of the year every year. One, it's to recognize not just the crime lab folks, but also law enforcement and everyone else in the criminal justice system, including the policymakers that utilize DNA databases to solve and prevent crime. Secondly, we use this program as a way to bring awareness because we know that uh, most of the world still does not have, has not passed DNA database legislation or implemented these programs. So through real life cases, we can bring the awareness to the rest of the world so they can also utilize this great tool to solve crime. And we know when we bring this awareness that it causes policymakers to take action not just on the legislation that allows the offender database programs to exist, but also with the funding necessary to implement these programs. So 2020, even with all that's going on in the world, we had 50 cases from 20 countries submit to the program. From those 50 cases, Gordon Thomas Honeywell took the list, studied it, and recommended 17 cases to go up to an international panel of seven judges. The judges then reviewed those cases and they ranked them one through 17 independently. We then took the top six from their ranking, completed more research, worked with the judges to study the cases. And then the judges got on an international conference call and ranked the cases one through six with the top cases case being the one they selected as the 2020 hit of the year. Let's meet our judges real quick. We have Jody Hines from Orange County, California. Walter Parsons from Innsbruck, Austria, Ronaldo Hinane, the Crime Lab Director from the Philippines, Magdalena Spolnica, the DNA Director from Poland, Mauricio Hernandez, the Crime Lab Director from Costa Rica, and Chris Sin, Sin the DNA Director from Singapore, and also Rock Harmon, a retired prosecutor from California, USA. So with the 50 cases that were submitted, there were a lot of common themes this year. Uh, uh, some of the top ones were familial searching, genetic genealogy, missing persons, and YSTR testing. So what I'm gonna do for the remainder of the presentation for about the next 40 so minutes, what we're gonna explain is we're gonna look at the cases first that were not selected in the top six, look at some of the common themes from those cases, and then save the second half of the presentation for the top six cases we'll, where we will go into more detail about each case. So let's kick it off. We had uh, the first topic we wanted, the common theme from the cases was the area of familial searching. We have a couple cases here. We also have a familial searching case to discuss in our top six cases. But in this case, in 1995, in a very uh, idyllic town in the coast of Sweden, in Billadol, Sweden, we had a rape of an eight-year-old girl that it was attacked on a bike ride home from her school. Um, she was dragged into the woods, sexually assaulted, and then in a very injured, she walked back to her home. This really shook this little community, very small community, and the, the police in Sweden did an extensive investigation. They, however, the DNA never matched. Like many countries, when the DNA doesn't match in the database, they ponder the idea of doing familial searching as another step. However, their law did not allow that. So they approached the Swedish parliament um, and eventually they decided in late 2018 to allow Sweden to be a country that does familial searching. They modeled their law on that of the United Kingdom that has done familial searching very effectively over the years in a very privacy conscious way. They have a national board that allows them to, that reviews the cases of which ones get to be approved for familial, familial searching and then go all through the privacy protections that are necessary to keep the, the privacy issues in check. Um, when they were allowed to turn the familial searching on, when the law went into effect on January 1, 2019, this case 
was one of the top ones that was approved by that board. And when they, as soon as they ran it, they got a candidate list uh, from the familial search, and they were able to investigate and arrest the person that committed this horrific crime. The next case relating to familial searching is a case coming to us from 2011 sexual assault of a woman in Dubai. And as you know, from the case that Dubai selected, submitted last year to hit of the year that was, I believe, chosen the second uh, ranked case, they go very aggressively on DNA approaches. And the, and the same occurred in this case. They ran the autosomal DNA mat, uh, to a database and there were no hits. They then did YSTR, they did MITO, they did phenotypic SNPs, nothing worked. And then they did familial searching. And what they thought of doing in this case, what I thought was very unique, is that since they already did YSTRs on the casework sample, they decided to do a layer of YSTRs on the candidate list produced by the familial search. And there was a match and that elevated it to the top and they were able to solve the case pretty quickly with that. So we thought this was a very unique application of YSTRs uh, integrating into familial searching. I'd like to say just a, mo a moment of familial searching and wonder if we're now at the tipping point of countries and states deciding to move forward with familial searching. As we can see, it works quite well. When you don't get a hit in your database, familial searching is a logical next step and it can be done effectively with a lot of privacy controls as exemplified uh, in the United Kingdom and now in Sweden and many other places as well. So I wonder, and I think that we are moving forward to more countries looking at this as an option, as a second step to searching when they don't get a match in their database. The next set of cases I wanna explain, uh, we entitled the extremism murders. And in this first case, in 2019, there was a murder of a very popular politician from the left side of the political spectrum that was very much disliked by the extremist factions in Germany. And he was assassinated in his home in Hessen, Germany. And unfortunately, there was no evidence at the crime scene that could be noticed by the police. But fortunately, they do have a wonderful crime lab there run by Dr. Harold Schneider. And they have a very unique process there that that lab and many others in Germany have developed, and they call it hot flaking. The idea is you take the clothes from the person that, that you're looking for the crime scene evidence from, and you take a piece of tape and you go around each inch of those clothes and you try to extract skin flakes. And they did this over a thousand times. They found a thousand skin flakes on the murdered politician's clothes. And one, actually only one, produced a DNA full profile. And one would think that would not likely be a hit in the database, but they got very luckily, lucky in this case, a needle in a haystack. That one profile they found through that hot flaking process matched in the German DNA database. And it, the person it hit to was a known member of the neo-Nazi party in Germany and therefore is now the main suspect in this case. He's been arrested and I believe they're in trial. And this case is a, just a testament to the hard work of the German crime lab to use that German-based system, the hot flaking process, to solve this case. The second case I want to mention of extremism murders is the 2019 sexual assault and murder of a 19-year-old girl walking through the woods in Jerusalem. This case is really, though, about speed. In 24 hours from the moment they found that body, the crime lab was able to get the DNA, process it, run it against the database, get a hit, and the police were able to arrest the suspect all within 24 hours. And this is a testament to Israel's ability to fund a DNA program that allows them to move that quickly to identify these individuals. And Israel has a very uh, strong DNA database law that has a high hit rate, which allowed this case to be solved as well. Unfortunately, when they arrested this individual, he declared that he came into Jerusalem that night to murder a Jewish person, therefore showing the extremism attentions of this killer. The next topic I wanna to talk about is missing persons. So in this case, um, in November of 1970, Female remains were found in a house fire in rural Minnesota, United States. Later that month, an 18-year-old girl at a university was declared missing. Um, it was 1970. They didn't have the systems to link these two cases at the time, so the two mysteries went on independently. Fast forward to 2013. The brother of the missing university's students, 
approached his parents who are now in their 80s. And he told them, he said, I learned about the United States Missing Persons Program and how you can have your DNA as the parents uploaded into it. And then if it matches human remains, uh, we now are able to bring our sis my sister home. And he did that. And unfortunately, there are no matches in our Estes database. A couple of years later, 2016, a cold case team in the rural part of Minnesota decided to run the human remains in that house fire. And when they did that and they uploaded it to the national database, there was a match. And this, these two mysteries were solved at that moment. This is a great end to this case. But I have to bring up the questions that a uh, little bit uh, make us wonder whether or not uh, we're doing the right thing here. Why did it take the brother of the missing daughter of the daughter to go to his parents and lobby them and explain to them about this process of giving your DNA to the United States National DNA Database? Shouldn't we have a program in place, government entity, a program that promotes the missing persons database so everybody knows who's missing a loved one in order that they're encouraged to upload their DNA? Secondly, 2016 is when they did the remain testing, but that body has been, DNA has been available in the missing persons program in the United States since the 1990s. So why did it take so long? I think that we have a problem, again, that we just do not promote our missing persons program here in the United States as much as it should be. And I know this problem is global as well. And to back this up in the United States with some statistics, currently there are 40,000 identified human remains in our medical examiner's offices throughout the United States. And only 13,000 of those 40,000 have been tested and uploaded to the National DNA Database. Furthermore, with thinking about these 40,000 samples where families are looking for them and then hundreds of thousands of other mis missing persons where there's no human remains, we only have 15,000 families that have uploaded their DNA to Endis. That tells me that we simply do not have the legal infrastructure, the funding, and the motivation for people to take advantage of this program to identify human remains. I think it's time in the United States that we focus on this and that we have some sort of national institute that brings all that together that allows this to happen routinely and could be a model for the other countries as well. <clears throat> Another missing persons case comes to us being solved by genetic genealogy. So in Idaho, United States, this case, 1979, uh, mummified uh, human remains that had been dismembered and chopped up were found in a lava tube in rural Idaho. They take that DNA and they compare it to the national database and there were no matches. They then decided in 2019 to apply genetic genealogy to that case. And they got a hit to Jed match and after 2000 hours, it led them to an 87 year old grandson of these human remains. And when they interviewed this person, this grandson, he had quite the tale to tell. He said, yes, my grandfather was not a good person. He apparently murdered my grandmother with an ax and the sheriff declared that he was looking for him for murder. <clears throat> he also told another tale that the town folks in that town put together a vigilante squad, vigilante squad, and they went out and tracked him down and murdered him. And then he said that this genealogy test now confirmed that rumor. So now we're gonna move over to the issue of DNA databases and exonerations. <clears throat> this, these cases were submitted, the first that I'm, they submit, I, I'm listing two, however, for the sake of time, I'm only gonna mention the first one. So 1976, the sexual assault and murder of a 15 year old girl in Flint, United Kingdom. The police developed two suspects in this case. One was an 18 year old boy who didn't speak English um, that it was a transient, and that's his picture today on the right. Um, he was interrogated very aggressively by the police and confessed to a crime that he did not commit and spent 20 years in prison. The second suspect they interviewed, they did not have enough evidence and they didn't convict him. So fast forward to current day, the police in the United Kingdom decided to reopen this case to go after the second suspect and see if the DNA uh, found on, with this girl is a match to the second suspect. And when they did the test, they found three things. One, that second suspect was not a match uh, to the DNA with the, that was found at the crime scene. Secondly, it didn't match the person that spent 20 years behind bars. So he got exonerated and the suspect got exonerated as well. 
So this is a great result to get both of those exonerated. But in addition to that, they found the true perpetrator because he was in the United Kingdom database when they ran that DNA. And if, just a reminder for those that don't know, the United Kingdom has probably the highest DNA hit rate in the world because they require everybody convicted and arrested to go into the database for a period of time. Their hit rate hovers around somewhere between 60 and 70 percent. And that's the type of result you can get when you have that large of a database policy in your laws. Um, <clears throat> so this case and the case beneath it um, are good examples of getting people that are in jail or have been in jail released and exonerated through the use of DNA. But more importantly, I believe, are the exonerations that happen not just in these types of cases uh, every once in a while. It's the exoneration that happens due to DNA databases probably on an hourly basis throughout this world. When police have these databases and hit on the right person quickly, they do not investigate somebody that is innocent. They do not knock on the door and ask them that they were, if they were involved in a serious crime, crime like a homicide and make that adrenaline go up in that individual and be worried until they're cleared. Because they find the right person with the database, they don't have to make these people feel uncomfortable through those types of, of uh, interrogations. And that is how DNA databases exonerate people daily throughout this world. So uh, just to mention a couple other cases here, uh, we're not gonna go through all of these, but uh, wanted to mention at least two. And the first one comes to us from Poland. We call it the power of Prum in Poland. So for a 20-year period, there were stranger rapes occurring in Czech Republic, Germany, and Poland. Then, then the Polish police arrested and convicted somebody. They went into the database and it hit to the rape in Poland. And because of the forward thinking of the European Union with the Prum Treaty, it also hit those rapes in Germany and Czech Republic. This next case we call criminals aren't always smart. And in this case, an individual staked out a jewelry heist in the United Kingdom. And he noticed that that jewelry store did not have a CCTV camera had it hooked up. So he did a tunnel underneath the store. And unfortunately for him, he made the wrong decision. He went the wrong way in the tunnel and went into another shop. And when he pulled himself through the tunnel, he touched and that shop did have a CCTV camera. And it saw exactly where he touched the police swab right there. They got DNA, went into the database. And of course, it's the United Kingdom. So they got a match. And that's how that case got solved. So we're now going to move over to the top six cases. And again, the judges went through and ranked those cases. And here are the six that they, they, they voted on in the end. And they ranked them one through six. And the cases they, they ranked were from Washington State, USA, California, USA, Brazil, Cal another California, USA case, France, and China. And we will talk about them in the order in which the judges place them. The first, the first one, the sixth place case, is the murder of Jane Hilton and the exoneration of Ricky Davis occurring in El Dorado Hills, California. And for those of you who don't know, El Dorado Hills is basically a suburb of the city of Sacramento in Northern California. So in 1985, Jane Hilton was murdered in her home. She was stabbed multiple times. She was bitten in the back and the police came and there were three uh, people that lived with her. They talked to them, but there was no other evidence and the case goes cold. They reopened the case in 1999. And they completed an interrogation of those three individuals. That was the focus of their investigation. And they focused on Connie Dahl and interrogated her and explained to her that the woman was bitten in the back and offered her some sort of immunity. And she therefore said, Ricky Davis was the one who did it. He stabbed her. I only held her down and bit her in the back. And with that immunity, um, that was the testimony that she gave. And Ricky Davis was convicted. This didn't sit well. Of course, the Ricky Davis always maintained his innocence, and the Innocence Project didn't like the status of that interrogation and that confession of, of um, uh, Connie Dahl. Um, so they took on the case. In addition, they did not take DNA in that case. So this Innocence Project actually focused with the Sacramento County Crime Lab and the prosecutor, the new generation of prosecutor in this case, uh, uh, was very uncomfortable with it to begin with, too. So he cooperated. 
and they they focused on the DNA from the nightgown on the spot where the woman said she bit, right? And if they could show that the DNA on that nightgown didn't match Connie Dahl, they could discredit her testimony, and it would be a, a an a ability to show that Ricky Davis did not commit this crime. Sure enough, the DNA did not match, but because they didn't match to anybody in the database, they couldn't show who committed the crime, they had to delay him getting out of prison, but they did offer him a new trial. But they didn't want to wait for the trial to be over to get Ricky Davis out of jail, so they decided to pursue genetic genealogy, and sure enough, they got a match to GEDmatch, did the genealogical research, and they hit to this individual. In fact, the gen match uh, occurred in uh, December of 2019, but the actual uh, hit in the, uh, the research, the, gen the, the genealogy research that took place just a few months ago, and this is the person that actually committed the crime. And now that they know who committed the crime, they allowed Ricky Davis to walk out of prison on February 13th, 2020. The fifth place case is the 1991 sexual assault and murder of Sarah Yarbo in the town of Federal Way, which is a, sub, a suburb of Seattle, Washington, which is actually just up the street from where I'm coming from you today, as I live in the Seattle area. So in 1991, uh, this 16-year-old girl that had a lot going for her uh, was murdered on her school grounds. And you can imagine the traumatic, um, she was sexually assaulted too, the traumatic uh, event of that for having her body found by st other students um, uh, and it just the impact on a school like that. They had DNA from the crime scene, but it never matched in CODIS. Interesting piece about this case, they actually were the first case to ever do YSTR surname searching. And when they did that, they hit to the Fuller family and they thought they had solved this case because there was a close friend that was named Fuller that was a friend of the Yarborough family. And however, upon the autosomal testing, it wasn't him. They tried to go up the relationship path and identify of other Fullers. However, the real suspect in this case, uh, his grandfather about 67 years ago, fell out of the Fuller family because he was adopted. So it was a dead end trail. So then in 2019, they did genetic genealogy and it led them to this individual and this case has been solved. Um, I do want to mention, though, uh, uh, some things about the database law here in Washington state uh, that controls the database of offenders in this region. Um, they had three missed opportunities, and it's just a reminder that the laws that are passed by your parliaments or your state legislatures in this case control how quickly you can solve a crime and how long these individuals would be on the streets perhaps committing more crime. So in this, this case, the three misses that they had based on our faulty laws, one, this individual was convicted of a sex crime before he murdered Sarah. And therefore, if the Washington state law would have required parolees to be in the database, they could have taken his DNA and after he committed the murder, they would have found him right away. Secondly, this individual was arrested for a sex crime, but then pled to a lower level sex crime and the Washington state legislature did not have that sex crime in the database policy when that occurred, and therefore they missed him a second time. And finally, this guy's brother was a, was a convicted rapist that was also in the Washington State database, and because Washington State government does not allow familial searching, we missed him a third time. So just a reminder, the policies made by the politicians are that they decide who gets identified for these terrible crimes. And we should look at all of our laws to determine whether or not they're set up in a way they can keep people like this off the street. So just to comment about, we've had these couple of cases in genetic genealogy. We had, of course, the big cases last year and the Golden State Killer and the very many other cases as well. What's the future of genetic genealogy in, the, in, in forensics? And I look at GEDmatch and the other databases that allow police to catch these criminals. It's kind of like a magic portal. And when it first happened last year and we saw these cases coming through, it, I couldn't believe it. it. It was basically, it changed everything, the way we think about solving crime with DNA. And it did a lot of work. And these are just some of the individuals, these cases in the United States that are never going to be solved that now, because of this magic portal, are gonna be solved. Um, I think where we're headed is that 
genetic genealogy, we've kind of worked through the backlog of the old cases that would never be solved. And from now on, I think we're going to see what we'll call a plan B approach on every new case. So if you have a homicide, a stranger rape, other types of assaults that can't be solved when you put the DNA into the CODIS database, you go to plan B, which is genetic genealogy. And I think that's just gonna integrate itself in a normal law enforcement practice. And we'll see that plan B on all cases going, all serious cases going forward. So the fourth place case is the 2008 murder of a mom and her daughter in Guangzhou, China. In fact, it was in a very upscale neighborhood in their high rise condo where somebody broke in to commit a property crime, ran into them, killed both of them, and left a single drop of blood behind at the crime scene. Now they took that DNA and they put it into the massive Chinese database. As you may know, China has 50,000 criminal offenders, or excuse me, 50 million criminal offenders in their database, the largest DNA database in the world by far. And again, if you don't solve them with an autosomal hit in that database, China is eventually gonna find the killer because in addition to those autosomal 50 million database, they also have 10 million folks that are in the YSTR database. So again, between the two, they're eventually gonna get a lead. And that happened in this case because <clears throat> In 2019, there was a YSTR match between somebody named June, who's an only child, to the killer's YSTR. They tried the autosomals against June, and there was no match. So like any good YSTR investigation, what do you do next? You go check the father and the father's brothers. And they did that, and there was no autosomal match. But a curious thing happened. They noticed through kinship testing that the father and the five uncles were all half-siblings to June and the killer. So this got the investigators thinking and they kind of figured it out and they went and got the DNA from June's grandfather and June's mother. And it turns out they produced a secret child that they put up for adoption. So the police went out, investigated the adoption records that led them to the true killer that they lured back to Guangzhou. And here the police are arresting him at the Guangzhou airport. So this case, very amazing case, a lot of work obviously went into solving this case. The third place case is a case that came from Woodland, California, USA. And in 2017, and Woodland, California is also, by the way, it's a, a suburb of the San Francisco area. And in 2007, excuse me, um, the remains of an infant boy were found in a metal chest and brought up uh, somebody fishing in a, in a canal. And the boy had been murdered clearly, but because of blunt for force trauma to his skull, and they took the DNA and put it in the missing persons database, but there were no matches. In 2018, the sheriff, the prosecutor, and the state police decided they were gonna try familial searching of the human remains against the offender database in California. However, there is not a process to search human remains in California for familial searching, although there is one for searching crime scene samples against convicted offenders. Um, but they got permission to do this, and when they did, they hit to the infant's father that uh, also was actually just three days from being released from prison. And then we asked, they asked him to identify the child. He wouldn't do it. So the investigators then went and researched all the children that he had been recorded as being the father of in California, and they got the, the, the genetic testing card from the hospital. In the first case that I'm aware of, they got a court order to take the DNA off the card and compare it to the human remains, where they determined that this boy, his name is Nico, um, and they were able to determine that from the, the genetic cards that were maintained um, at the hospital. But very disturbing about this case, during the research, they also determined that were four other infants that have not been heard of since they were born. And so as a result of that, uh, this county has charged this individual for five counts of murder, a serial infanticide case that's going on currently. And we're going to hear a lot more about this case as it plays out in the court. So that leaves us with two finalist cases. We have the cases from Brazil and the case from France. So the judges voted and they determined that the 2020 hit of the year is the case from Brazil. And so before I outline that case, and also we're fortunate uh, after I speak, we're gonna hear for a few minutes from the crime lab and investigators from the Brazilian Federal Police 
about the case. But before I do that, I want to talk to you about the French case. So this case, it's called The Little Martyr of the A-10 Motorway in Blois, France. So this, this little child that you see here in the picture, she was about four years old, was abused and abandoned and thrown in this ditch where the police officer is pointing. She was clearly abused for the following reasons. One, they found that she had broken bones that had healed and, and re-injured over time. Um, she had human bite marks on her body. She had marks from an iron where she had been scorched and she had been very malnourished. So this case became a very important case to the people of France. Apparently it was the most investigated case for about 15 or 20 years. They really wanted to know who she was and where she came from. The DNA story goes like this in this case. 1993, uh, when DNA got its legs, they resumed the body, took the DNA from the remains, tested it against the databases, and there was no match. In 2008, they decided to do phenotypic SNPs. And you can imagine this was before next generation. So it meant that the Thermo Fisher Scientific 3130 device was chugging away over time and eventually cranked out the right SNPs to determine that they were from North American ancestry. Then in 2013, DNA technology took another leap forward and they were able to do more touch DNA. And as a result of that, they were able to fi find a full sibling DNA on the, 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 the deceased child's blanket. And because the French policy allows them to upload those types of samples to their database, that probably not from the killer because it was a young child's DNA, um, into the database, this proved to be the perfect solution to this case because in 2017, the sibling was convicted of a, a crime in France and went into the French offender database and therefore matched to the DNA that that person left uh, on the blanket. And as a result of that, they were able to research this case, find the mother, and she has been charged and arrested for neglect and murder. So that leads us to the 2020 hit of the year, which is called by the media in Brazil and throughout the world actually, is the robbery of the century. And the reason it's called the robbery of the century because it's a blockbuster case. As you'll see it, it feels like it's a movie script. And it was committed by the largest criminal organization in Brazil. The crime actually occurred in Ciudad del Este, which is in Paraguay. And for those of you who have not heard of this town, it's a, the second largest city in Paraguay. It's actually on the border. Uh, a river separates it from Brazil and Argentina. And it is known to being the community close to the, the beautiful Iguazu Falls um, that is apparently the largest waterfalls in the world. So it is, as I mentioned, it was committed by the largest criminal organization in Brazil. It is known as the PCC. It has 20,000 members. It's active in 22 of the 27 Brazilian states, as well as other South American countries. It focuses on drug trafficking, big time robberies like this one and other illicit activities. They rule over the, the famous favelas in Brazil. And as one of our judges on our panel this year said that's from the region, unfortunately, strong, strong criminal organizations are part of our life in Central and South America. So this was the crime scene. This is what occurred April 20. 2017, the target was 40 million US dollars that was stashed inside of the Progressor's uh, cash transit facilities office in this town. And over 50 heavily armed assailants prepared at a staging house in Paraguay. They then crossed into Paraguay in a military style raid. They blew up the building, they grabbed the vaults took as much money as they could, and then created a path of destruction as they worked their way back into Brazil that ended with a three-hour shootout with the Brazilian federal police. So here are the crime scenes in the case. We had... Uh, <clears throat> we have the Paraguay staging house. Where the 50 people uh, staged the crime. We had the bomb blast of the Perseguer site, and we had the shootout with the Brazilian police. From those three crime scenes, the Brazilian federal police collected 457 pieces of evidence, 
And from that, they had touched DNA from abandoned escape boats and vehicles. They had DNA throughout the staging house on bedding, on plates, things like this. They had DNA from weapons and explosives left at the, at the, uh, the bomb site. And they had blood from the bullet wounds from the shootout with the police. They also had three suspects that died in the shootout. They had their DNA that got uploaded. And they had seven suspects that got captured at the shootout. They had their DNA and it got uploaded. So in the end, the Brazilian, Brazilian Federal Police Crime Lab were able to find from these 457 pieces of evidence, 47 full profiles that they put into their database. In addition, the 11 suspects that also went into the database. And just give you a, a little bit of background about the Brazilian CODIS system. It's the second largest installation of CODIS behind the United States. They have 20 state network that upload to a, a national DNA database, the Brazil Federal Police. Um, but the DNA database in Brazil is quite new. In fact, uh, it just it started to move forward just a couple years ago because of a decision by the government of Brazil to make DNA testing in its database the top priority to fight crime in Brazil. But since it's just started, it only has 70,000 criminals in the database. However, we predict in the next five years, Brazil will probably be one of the top five databases size-wise in the world. So the 47 uh, crime scene samples and 11 offenders got uploaded in the database, and here were the hits that occurred as a result of that. First, nine of the 11 suspects matched to the crime scene. So that from the shootout, they were able to, because they mat, they took the DNA, they met, they compared it to the DNA found at the staging house and at the bomb blast, and therefore, they were able to place these suspects at that crime scene. Secondly, 14 of the 47 crime scene profiles linked to other serious crimes. And there were big serious crimes that were conducted by this gang. Just a couple of examples. There was a murder of a federal agent that it linked to. Another one was a 28 million similar heist of a Brinks car company uh, facility. And in addition to that, as I mentioned, excuse me, um, in addition to that, uh, there were matches to offenders. However, because this is a new database, there's only 70,000 people in it, you weren't going to have a lot of hits of these 47 profiles in the beginning. It's about the future in this case, and that's exactly what happened. There wasn't any instant matches to offenders in the database when they put these 47 in. They came later, and they'll continue to come. And this is exactly what happened in June of 18. Uh, one of the people at the crime scene matched when they got convicted and put in the database, it happened again in March of 19, again in July of 19, again in March of just a couple months ago, March of 2020. So again, this is about the future with this case. Um, they have 13 identifications so far. There's 34 to go. And because of the investment by the Brazilian government to build this database, our guess is that most of these 47 people that were at those crime scenes are going to hit the database over time. So I think the, the judges in this case, they voted it number one for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, the blockbuster nature of it. And secondly, the hard work of the Brazilian police crime lab. I mean, they have 400 plus samples they had to work through uh, and, and under very difficult circumstances it was amazing work. Third, as we talked about, the future of the DNA database program in Brazil and the recognition of the government to make it a strong program. And finally, what DNA can do to take a bite out of these criminal organizations. So those four things combined are the reason they ranked it uh, the number one case. So before we hand it over to our friends in Brazil uh, that were uh, selected as the number one case, I do want to make some acknowledgments, of course, everybody from the Brazil Federal Police. Secondly is our DNA hit of the year judges. They did a wonderful job reviewing these cases. We know it's a lot of work, so thank you very much, judges. And Kyle Schroeder and Hannah Jones from Gordon Thomas Honeywell did a lot of work as well to put this program together this year. And finally, Thermo Fisher Scientific. Thank you so much. Uh, you folks sponsor this program every year. We couldn't do it without you. And thank you for allowing us to explain these cases and the selection by the judges at your annual HIDS conference. So with that, I'll hand it over to the Brazil folks. Thank you very much. The robbery of the century. A big, a big case, the biggest one in the forensic DNA lab of the Brazilian Federal Police. And now it is the DNA hit of the year 2020. This is so important to us 
and it was such an honor working on this case, gathering all the data and having the opportunity to show it to you. That's I'm here in English because I want to address directly to first Chin Schauber. In behalf of whom I thank the Gordon Thomas Hanwell Group for sponsoring the DNA Hit of the Year program. Thank you, Kyle Schroeder, for your patience and real interest in understanding all the details of this case. With so many profiles, crime scenes, links, I know it was a little bit tricky sometimes. I want to thank all the judges for recognizing our hard work on this case. We are so many involved, federal and state forensic DNA experts, CSI experts, and criminal investigators. This award is a big push for us to keep going and growing proudly. And thanks to Tamar Fisher for always being a partner and having us here at HIDS virtual conference. Preciso novamente agradecer a todos os peritos que contribuíram de alguma forma, no caso Prosegur, em especial os lotados no Laboratório de Genética Forense da Polícia Federal. Vocês são os melhores e teria sido impossível sem vocês. Gostaria de fazer um agradecimento especial a três colegas e amigos que também são minha inspiração, Guilherme Jacques, Hélio Buchmiller e Mega Áurea. Eles iniciaram o Laboratório de Genética Forense na Polícia Federal e juntamente com Paulo Roberto Fagundes, o então é diretor técnico científico, que assim, para trazer o Coutos para o Brasil em 2009, podendo, sim, dar início à rede integrada de banco de perfis genéticos, sem a qual não estaríamos aqui. Esse DNA Hits of the Year é fruto da árvore que vocês plantaram. Obrigada. Na condição de chefe do laboratório de DNA à época do crime, como atual administrador do Banco Nacional de Perfis Genéticos, eu posso afirmar com seguridade que o caso Prossegu foi o maior caso da genética forense brasileira. Não só devido à quantidade de amostras analisadas, mas também com relação à grande complexidade das inter-relações encontradas entre os vestígios. Diversos locais de crime foram examinados e centenas de vestígios foram coletados. Isso originou mais de 500 amostras biológicas, todas Amor analisadas no laboratório de DNA da Polícia é Federal, para... federais altamente capacitada e comprometida. Essa equipe trabalhou arduamente e exclusivamente sobre esse caso durante semanas, o que gerou rápidos resultados que auxiliaram a investigação apontando possíveis autores e a dinâmica dos fatos. Esse caso motivou a mudança de fluxo de trabalho do laboratório de DNA, levando a implementar rotinas que nos permitissem a maior produtividade, com os mesmos recursos humanos que tínhamos à época. Dezenas de perfis genéticos foram obtidos e inseridos no Banco Nacional de Perfis Genéticos, uma ferramenta fantástica que até hoje, três anos após o crime, vem registrando coincidências entre vestígios e indivíduos relacionais de crime. Resultados como esses fortalecem os bancos de perfis genéticos e enchem de orgulho a toda a sociedade brasileira, que pode contar hoje com uma ferramenta científica e robusta para eles deste de outros casos. Preciso aqui reconhecer todo o esforço e agradecer principalmente a dedicação de toda a equipe do Laboratório de DNA da Polícia Federal, bem como a todos os peritos de genética forense do Brasil, que fazem da rede integrada de bancos de perfis genéticos uma realidade. A vocês, meu muito obrigado. Bom, o que eu tenho para falar sobre o roubo à base da ProSegur do Paraguai, que foi um divisor de águas na história da investigação criminal brasileira. Eu sou muito grato por ter participado e colaborado nesse caso fantástico que envolveu diversas agências, gerou o maior levantamento de perfis genéticos já feito pela Polícia Federal. Para você ter uma ideia, até hoje foram registrados 22 roubos nessa modalidade, que nós chamamos de domínio de cidades. O prejuízo gerado foi de mais de meio bilhão de reais. A investigação foi um grande golpe contra o crime organizado. Por quê? Porque permitiu o maior número de identificação de envolvidos de todos os grandes roubos desse tipo registrados aqui no país. O resultado foi tão positivo que se tornou referência nacional e disseminou a cultura de preservação de local, a coleta de vestígios para a extração de DNA. Aquilo que antes a gente via em cenas de filme se tornou realidade na investigação brasileira. Depois desse caso, policiais de todo o Brasil começaram a alimentar ainda mais o Banco Nacional de Perfis Genéticos e aos poucos estamos identificando os novos criminosos que participaram do roubo. 
Esse reconhecimento vem coroar o trabalho excelente feito pelos policiais federais e de outras forças que também se uniram para atuar na investigação. Eu gostaria de fazer um agradecimento especial aos peritos Giovanni e Volk, daqui da Polícia Federal de Foz do Iguaçu, foram incansáveis na liderança da equipe que realizou levantamentos e produziu centenas de laudos. E também aos diversos peritos, agentes, escrivães, papiloscopistas e delegados que viraram noites trabalhando nesse caso. A todos os policiais envolvidos, meu muito obrigado por fazerem parte de um time que escreveu essa história e será sempre lembrado como um marco para a investigação criminal. Great. I think we're uh, we're back on. Great. So everybody, thank you again for uh, taking the time to listen to this year's DNA Hit of the Year presentation. I just wanted to, because we were unable to list the names of the three Brazilian folks that presented at the end, I wanted to give you uh, their information. Uh, the first person that spoke, her name is Ana de Castro. She is a senior forensic scientist in the Brazil Federal Police. The second speaker was Ronaldo da Silva. He is the National DNA Database custodian. And the final speaker was Emerson Rodriguez, who is the head of investigations for this case for the Brazilian Federal Police. Obviously, you could tell by their excitement, uh, their, uh, how important it was in this for people to work on this case throughout the Federal Police Organization in Brazil. So with that, everybody, I know it's been a, uh, a, uh, a great morning for you for your conference, and I'll hand it back to B. and I just appreciate being able to present the DNA Hit of the Year, and we'll see you next year. Thank you. B. B, I, uh, just, it sounds like you're muted, B, just so you're aware. Uh, your computer must be on mute. Yes, Tim, <laughs> thank you. I was on mute. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Okay. Virtual anyway, world. Right? Was... <laughs> thank you. I was on mute. So anyway, thank you, Tim. Um, I was saying anyway, thank you to everyone that did submit their cases to share with us because um, it, it really gives us hope that no matter how heinous the crime is, whether it's a big crime or a small crime, or how long ago it took place, someone is still looking into it. And as technology evolves and countries expand and establish their database, there is more hope that these cases will still get close as time goes on. So that's really hopeful. Um, so thank you, Tim. And at this time, we'll take a 25-minute break to give you a, a chance to see the conference, the exhibition posters and application halls. And we'll see you back here at 12.30 Singapore time, 1.30 Japan Korea time, and 2.30 Australian Standard time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>